welcome everybody to another episode of the Coffee Cast, where this week we've decided not to replace Megan with a supermodel. Instead, <laughs> we've replaced her with a model citizen, a grower, and a guy that is, well, into to, to greenery. Please welcome Rick Graves. Thank you. Uh, so, this is the thing. Megan always, like, sends me interesting people, and, and she was like, you're going to love Rick. And I was like, great, what does he do? And she never texted me back. Oh. I haven't heard from her in three days. So, given that your last name is Graves, one, she's all right, right? Yeah, she's fine. Okay. <laughs> but, but two, how do you and Megan know each other? Well, uh, I set up a little fruit stand here. I'm in the community agriculture. Oh. And, you know, it's a long tradition around these parts to help out where you can and if you can, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I feel it's my kuleana, which is my responsibility and my opportunity to be able to take the food that I grow in my backyard. I've got about a third of an acre right down here on Vineyard. Wow. And uh, get it out there into the community. It's organically grown, great food for your health. And, uh, you know, it brings a smile to people's face when yeah. something is provided locally, you know, and at affordable rates. You know, the, one of the things is, is like, people don't realize when it comes to white loaf food, the history of the home garden is deep. Oh, deep, yeah. It used to be heaven planting. You'd have an avocado and a mango tree in every backyard and also a kuleana wellspring. A lot of those haven't been maintained, have gone away, but the idea remains that we can be self-sufficient and then, you know, abundance is about, you know, growing that spirit of sharing, that social consciousness, yeah. you know? So scarcity and poverty is something that I think really is a social construct. If you remember to share, there's always enough to go around. Yeah, and that's, that's like, how do I say that? It's kind of ingrained in the Wailuku. That's, that's been a thing since like mom and pops, mom and pops day. That's it, you know, if you have too much, you, you first place you look is over the fence to see if somebody wants to, you know, have some oranges or some avocados. You don't want to have them wasted on the ground. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because even when I moved to Pukalani, the first thing I did in my neighborhood is I drove around the block just to see what was growing in people's yards. That's it, and there's an amazing amount of abundance, right? Huh. You know, they call it subsistence living, and it's looked down upon as some sort of poverty-stricken thing, but it's just a removal of the cash from the system, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah, this is the thing, too. Like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, and I know you're not a medical doctor, so I'm not asking for medical advice, but uh, enzymes and histamines are something that are, let's say, very, very regional, right? Right. Uh, if the enzymes in the soil in here in Wailuku won't be the same as the ones in Pukalani, nor will the, the, the flora of, um, gosh, the histamines. Well, you know what? You're talking about immunity, and right. all immunity is local-based. So if you want a strong body that is able to stand up to the local diseases, you're going to want to eat the local medicine. And the, there's no greater medicine than local food. And that's the thing that I've heard too, is like, if, if you, especially like fruits and stuff, if you ingest the fruits of a certain area, it gives you those histamines that prepare you should there be like too much pollen or things like that. It that's kind of right. conditions you to live in that area. Well, another important thing is bee pollen. So bees are, wild bees especially, are going around and there's a lot of really good bee companies here mm -hmm. on land. So the wider the spectrum of the bee pollination collection zone, the more antihistamines, the more immunity you get from eating that honey. So the first thing when you touch down somewhere is eat a spoon of that local honey. I know the vegans will disagree, but that really is a built-in way of getting everything that you need from the local area di sort of distilled, enzymatically, histamatically, and uh, you know, just on a, a microbiotic scale. That's the word I was looking for, because a lot of people are a lot of people, not just in the health industry, but just people in general are going, you know, that's what we got away from. Yeah. As soon as we stopped eating the, the tomatoes that came from my tomato garden, and they came from four states away tomato garden, things kind of changed. Not, right. just, the, not just the taste, which this is something that I really need to, clear, to clarify. But people that have just bought vegetables out of a grocery store their whole lives, Vegetables really don't taste like that, do they? No. You know, one of the things about nutrition is it tastes good. 
yeah. <laughs> so if anybody's eaten from a local farmer or a local farmer's market, the first thing you know, they'll tell you is like, wow, that's delicious. And it makes you feel good through the taste, but also the vitamins and minerals involved. That's the reason that it's so tasty. Mm -hmm. Same thing with color. If something is small and colorful, that means it has more vitamins and minerals packed into it, whether it's leafy greens or small cherry tomatoes or the purple carrots. That's why I always try and grow the, the most packed in nutrition. So not only local, but you're getting the most bang for your buck when it comes to nutrition. Uh, do you grow for, for pleasure or for profit? I grow for pleasure. There's, there's not a lot of profit in local-based <laughs> agriculture. But I, it's a labor of love because I'm trying to get away from the idea of like money is always the bottom line. For instance, when I'm down here on my fruit stand, mm -hmm. it's about the quality of interactions per hour. Ah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's something too, is like when you used to get with your neighbors and trade your vegetables and your fruits, that was your whole social circle. There wasn't no Facebook and a Twitter thing. No, you meet there. every day to share your food and literally it changes the model from an accumulation and stagnation and dog eat dog model into a model of mutually agreeable transactions where we're helping each other out. You, you know? know, I mean, with all this talk about growing stuff and like simple lifestyle, do you ever find yourself on a rocking chair doing something called whittling? I mean, whittling, oh yeah, you know, you gotta find your peace of mind and whittling's one of the best, right? <laughs> Mostly on the campsite in front of the campfire, right? But you know, I find weeding. You know, a lot of people say that, you know, they don't do gardening because it's too hard work, right? But think about the meditation that you receive when you're squatting in the garden and you're seeing the, fa you know, the families of birds and butterflies and bees around you and you're just doing a repetitive movement that is part of the land. You know, they say, Malama the Aina, the Aina will love you, right? That's the whole concept. Well, a lot of psychiatrists these days are recommending that people actually get gardens, work with their hands to kind of unplug from that digital overload lifestyle that we are in. That's it. It's about real life transaction and real life interaction, not necessarily accumulation, stagnation, disease, isolation. You know, uh, the seven fishes concept, Polynesian concept before refrigeration, seven families would be in a circle and they'd have a meeting house in the middle. So one family per day would collect the food, the fish, the vegetables, the fruit, put it in the middle, they'd all eat together. Then the next family's job is to do that the next day. That leaves six families six days out of the week to play, as long as you rotate that job. We just have to remember to share and there's plenty to go around. Yeah, you know, I mean, I feel like, almost like I'm not an, an earthy enough host for this show. I feel like there should be like some deep voiceover guy going, Simple Rick likes to sit on his porch and whittle a little while he thinks about his tomatoes. Well, you know, Wailuku's always been that way. I live in an Okinawan neighborhood and, you know, people have always shared food over the, over the fence. And, and like you said, it's sort of the, the way it was set up for each household to be self-sufficient and yet have enough to want to share, to be able to share. Yeah, it wasn't just the social interaction, it was everybody's bread bowl. It's a necessity, right? You know, if you think about it, you take away refrigeration, you know, you take away all of these incentives that we have to not share with each other, and the commerce of the future is relationship. Can we get along? Can we come to a mutually agreeable interaction? You know? Hmm. You know, I kind of I kind of like where this is going. I mean, have you thought about starting a farm cult? <laughs> Well, I saw Game of Thrones and I saw what happened there. The marauders came in and killed them all. So okay, it's, yeah. it, cult is not the word I'm going for. I'm talking about a cultural shift, you know? Yeah, and it does seem like people now are starting to kind of explore that olden culture of, you know what, I am as dependent on the things in my yard as my neighbor is. Correct. I'm also as dependent on the things in their yard as they are. Well, we all affect so each other. Yeah. You know, we're, we're packed in here in Wailuku, so, you know, I'm not saying things are perfect. I'm not saying everything, you know, people are, are trained to share. I think it's in our hearts, and it, it's, it's something that we need to remember is the most successful way of survival. You know, it's not working right now. <laughs> like... Hey, yeah, you got a point. <laughs> I, there's the thing, you know, I mean... A lot of people would see a guy like you and they would say, well, of course, look at him. He's obviously of the earth. He knows how to do all this plant stuff. Me, I am the, the grim reaper of plants. I am the black thumb of gardening. Right. But everybody's got to start somewhere. So yeah. if somebody wanted to start like their own little sustainable on their property, 
just 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 enough to feed them. How do you get started at that level? I'd, I'd say start with what's comfortable for you, right? You know, every gorilla, you know, there's an old saying, you eat a gorilla a bite at a time, right? You're not going to be the master gardener, Ron Finley, overnight. Yeah. You know, and I grew up in a country environment, so gardening sort of got into my blood, you know? Mm -hmm. So just start with one plant. Care for that plant in your windowsill. Choose a, a plant that you really love to eat, that you want to share, maybe a flower, something that gives you beauty, maybe a fern, you know, something that you have an affinity for that you're going to want to get up in the morning and feed just as if it's your pet or your friend or your, your partner in life. Talk to that plant. You know, it sounds crazy, but the plant will actually like become a companion. Form a relationship with the earth. Get down there and feel it with your toes and your fingers. And you stop telling yourself the story that you're killing the plant because you're not. You're watering the plant every day. You're interacting with the plant. The plant is providing a return to your interaction. That's what I'm saying about the relationship. So you have to develop a relationship with each plant that you're caring for. So it's not just about fruits. It's about how the plant is growing, that how it looks, the plumage, as it were. You can tell whether a plant is healthy if you have a relationship with it, you know, and play it classical music. You'll see it thrive. <laughs> Scream at it like project all your psychological inadequacies and trauma on it, it may wither and die. Wow. <laughs> you know, like, Have we thought about trap music? What does that do to a plant? I haven't tried that yet, but I heard through scientific method and experimentation, and it's, I want to recommend The Secret Life of Plants as a um, book and a movie if you want to know more about that. Uh, their favorite music is Bach classical music. Well, there you go. Who knew plants were like music snobs? Kind of. They just like a calm atmosphere. They don't. Their, their least favorite music is apparently punk and metal. So uh, <laughs> I gotta go. I love punk and metal, but you know I'm a little more edgy than my plant friends. So, so you have to like wear headphones around. That's it. You know, and even then they're like, "Hey, you're not paying attention to us." So <laughs> oh, there's nothing like a jealous plant. That's it. You know, I'm sounding a little crazy right now, but the idea is to normalize the idea that you have a relationship with every living thing on Earth. Nice. A lot of people don't, don't, don't see that as the core, but it really is it. You, you have to normalize interaction with plants as a relationship, interaction yes. with the streets. Why not? We have an interaction with, I mean, it's no good to like, hey, stop raining, you know, like shake your fist at the sky. You have to like, hey, it's raining. What do I do with that, you know? <laughs> well, here's, here's something I want to tie off with because we've talked about all these lovely plants that now I'm sure everybody is like I gotta taste it oh yeah how do they get your plants because you said you set up here on Sundays but you also set up well Sundays here at 11 in front of Wailuku Coffee Company is a great way get here early is a diversity of products um, on Instagram at wailukufarms.com I always announce what I'm bringing down so everything from eggplant to arugula I got a lot of light leafy greens coming in collards are super popular right now Getting a lot of foodies and chefs actually getting in touch with me and then coming by to pick their own. Wow. So earlier we talked about that refuge oasis feeling that you get in the backyard, you know, that we're trying to foster in our own minds and in our own spirits. Mm. When you come pick your own food, that's a next level adventure. You're not quite sure what you're gonna get. You have in mind maybe a meal, but that meal might be even better by the time you finish. And you also might have learned a little bit about peace of mind, a little bit about, you know, which plants are appropriate for which kind of lifestyle, you know, whatever it is that, you know, maybe we trade a couple of recipes while you're there, you know. So again, it becomes an interaction rather than just, well, I expect my plants to be, you know, packaged for me and show up at my door. Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> so it's all about local base. Come down to Wailuku, walk around. The reason I deliver it by bicycle cart is because I don't want to take up parking space. I don't want to cause congestion. I want to cause convenience and show people, again, it's normal to just walk down and say hello to your neighbors, you know? Like, we, we have a little one mile radius downtown Wailuku. Everybody knows each other, you know? Why should we have to drive miles and miles away to get good food when we're all growing it right around here and we can remember to share it as well? Yeah, I know. Who do you think you are, Pukalani? <laughs> Sorry. I mean, nothing against Pukulani. It's a wonderful thing, you know, but the people here, sometimes they're just walking around after church on their way home. They want to be able to pick up their good organic food that way, too. 
Yeah, and that's the that's the thing. It's like if you look at all of those nice, nice old films of the of the good old days. Yeah. You'd see that. Uh, that that was part of the Sunday adventure. Yeah, I grew up in New Zealand. I literally walked five miles to school and back, and along the way is all these honesty boxes. And so you get your green groceries on your way home from work or whatever, and you get your your duck eggs from the guy down the street, you know. And it's a symbiotic relationship with your environment. Wow. Well, I gotta say thanks for coming out. Oh, and before we forget, because this is about the White Lupin Coffee Company, today I thought medium mocha for Mr. Graves, as well as this vegan walnut coffee cake. How was that? It was excellent. You know, this may be coffee talk, but I gotta give you the tea. Wailuku Coffee Company is the best. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I can't deny that. Well, until next time, uh, make sure you like, subscribe, and share. Check out Rick wherever you see the bicycle car, and you know what? Try growing your own. I think that's good advice. That's it. Come to me for some seeds. Yeah. <laughs> Until next time. See ya. Bye now.